If you've got your notebooks, you may want to get them out. Writing uh, in this, and um, some people find that disconcerting at the beginning, but what it is, that's part of the, the genius of this whole thing, is that nobody sleeps in any of our workshops. Amazing. I mean, we go in Bolivia literally from 7 a.m., Till 9 or sometimes 10 o'clock at night, stopping for meals, that's all. They're, they are very, very, they, uh, I don't know, they just love it. And uh, they get mad. They got mad at us, not this time, but the time before, because uh, one evening I was sick, and the other guy, um, I'd, I'd gone to another town nearby, and, um, and the guys finished like at 9 o'clock. I think John was the last guy to teach that night. And uh, John and Larry were there, and they were, keep on going <laughs> and they were I was the next guy up to bat and I wasn't there but uh so they had to shut her down but anyway th this is um this is part of it just kind of using the notebooks and um uh, but more than anything what we try to model in teaching this is that we're teaching the word of God this is our textbook and I hope you see that as we go through that um that um we're the comments that we're making, the notes that you're filling in the blanks on are, are really a supplement to this book because this is the Word of God. This is what changes lives. And what we're trying to do through the DM2 programs is get people back to the Word of God and get them away from um, what, what would be uh, cotton candy Christianity, you know. You, you can never get a mouthful of cotton candy. You keep stuffing it in there, but it just, it just doesn't fill your mouth. And so much of Christianity today is cotton candy. And what we're trying to do is maybe mince up the meat a little bit for you so you can get it in there. But we want you to get the meat of the Word of God. And uh, this is a, just a way to do it. It's not necessarily the best method in the world, but it is a method that, that we've found effective to do that. So as you think of Romans... What we're seeking to do is to teach the grace of God. In a world where legalism abounds or license abounds, we, we believe that what people need is a, is a revisitation of the whole concept of, of grace. What is grace? What is biblical grace? You know, grace today is like so many people say, uh, we have this free gift, you know, we're going to give out. And you hear it on the radio, on Christian radio, it's the worst of all, you know. We've got this free gift, and the guy says, uh, Bob, what's our free gift for this month? And he says, uh, well, we've got this book that we've written uh, on this subject, and, uh, and it's a free gift to all of our hearers who give a donation of $50. And, uh, and that's grace today. That's free gift. You know, it's, it's no longer a no-strings-attached prospect. Grace is now full of strings. And uh, go with me to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. When you think of grace, you think of a person. You think of a gift. You think of God in eternity past preparing um, the Lamb of God, preparing together with the Son as they determined before the world began that Christ would be crucified. And I can't understand all of that except that I know that Christ was crucified in the mind of God from the foundation of the world. But in chapter, um, chapter 1, verse 14 of John, we said, and we see, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, the grace of God is bound up in the person of Jesus Christ. And if we clearly see Christ and we clearly understand Christ, we begin to get a picture of, of grace and grace we all we all know the 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 meaning of grace grace is unmerited favor or undeserved kindness and yet you really get the the understanding of that when you see God the Son 
leaving the portals of heaven and the, and the comforts and the glory of heaven to come and become one of us and to live among us and to lay down his life for the likes of you and I, undeserving sinners. That's grace. There's no greater expression of that. It's, grace would be um, you looking at an ant that's going to get run over by a dump truck. And so to, to keep that ant from dying, you convert yourself into an ant. And you go down and you, you tell this ant, hey, there's a dump truck coming. Get out of the road. And as you do that, the dump truck runs over you. That's, that's a small picture of grace, but it's nothing compared to the God that created the universe coming to become one of us and then allowing himself to, um, to be the sacrifice, the substitute for us to pay the penalty for sin. And this is what God has done. He has become one of us in order to save us. And so uh, John 1.17 says this, For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. But it, it doesn't stop there. The next verse says, No man has seen God at any time, the only begotten God, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. And so Jesus Christ is grace and truth come down to be, the, to be ex, the expression of God the Father among us. And he allowed himself to, to, to be crucified, to, to die the death penalty of the day for us. And that's grace. You and I are the ones who have broken the laws. You and I are the ones who... Uh, should have been uh, destroyed. But instead of destroying us, God allowed his son to die our death for us. And so this is what we're looking at as we look at Romans, as we look at the gospel. We're looking at the grace of God and it's bound up in this person of Jesus Christ. And it's bound up in the work that he did for us on Calvary Run with me over to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 is an amazing chapter because it speaks of how God took people like uh, DM2 types and he used them for his, his glory and he took a message that was rejected, uh, a kind of a, a despicable message and made it to be his wisdom and we see that in chapter 1, verse 18, for the word of the cross, the gospel, the word of the cross, is to those who are perishing foolishness, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And God says, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. And so we have God uh, using what the world would despise and reject to be the very wisdom of God. And part of that is this whole thing of Christ being crucified. How could, a, how could a person who suffered capital punishment do anything for you? How could, how could someone who took the needle, how, how could someone who, who, who sat in the electric chair do, do anything for you? How could that, a message like that be a life-saving message? And yet, it is the wisdom of God. And you see, the, the gospel is a, a person and what he did. And for this reason, look at chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And when I came to you, and this is talking evangelism stage, when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. 
For I determined to know nothing among you except a person, Jesus Christ, and a work, and him crucified. You see, the gospel is about a person and what he did for us. And that person is God who became a man. And that's what we're hoping to express to you over this next little while. So without any further introduction, let's go right back to the book of Romans. And um, remember that Romans was written um, by Paul to a church he had never uh, seen, so to speak. He knew individuals in the church, but he didn't do the evangelism there. And so he's wanting to bring them a, a, a panoramic picture of what is salvation and how does a person come from zero to Christ and what is, what is necessary to understand. And this is one of the greatest books in that sense because it takes everything you need to know in the Christian life and, and pu pushes it down into bite-sized sound bites through, through, the, through the book. Something that you and I can, can grasp and hold on to and clearly understand. It, each one of the things that I think we're going to look at in here could be expanded and become an enormous study. But what Paul is doing is taking all this enormous truth and bringing it down to something that, that the Roman church, a church he had never evangelized, could understand. And so we begin in chapter 1, in verses 1 um, through 7 to begin with. But this is kind of a section of introduction that begins in chapter 1-1 one, one and goes through verse 17. And so verse 1 says this, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom also you, uh, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray as we begin. Our Father, we come this morning recognizing, Lord, that if we are not in a place of fellowship with you, we will, we will learn facts, we might learn um, information, but we really won't be taught of you. And, and so may each one of us, Lord, have that clean heart that you would so desire for us and Lord, we um, thank you for 1 John 1, 9, which says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so may each one of us be in a position to really understand and hear the word of God. Father, I just um, want you, Lord, to take your word, use your servant, Lord, to, to present it in a way that's understandable. And we look to you. We don't look to our own intellect and um, e even to our studies, but we look to you to take the word of God and to really apply it to our lives in the way that would be pleasing to you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, as we, as we begin this chapter one, we're looking at the justice of God being introduced. How does God... Uh, is God a just God? How does God make people right with himself? How does God justify people? And this is how it begins in chapter 1 and develops on up through chapter 5. And then we see how God uh, takes and makes us righteous as individuals in a practical sense in chapter 5 and through 8. And then we see how that one day we're going to be totally righteous in the sight of God. As we, as we stand in glory, and that'll be the, the third kind of aspect we'll see of, of our one, one salvation. In chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, Paul wrote about his own personal accountability for the gospel. 
And um, though we are not apostles, <clears throat> and though we do not have this direct commission given to us that Paul's explaining here, I believe that each one of us are accountable and responsible for the gospel. And I think that sometimes we take the gospel and we carry it very, very loosely. Can you imagine taking something very valuable and holding it with a loose hand? Um, we, we don't do that in real life. I remember as even as a child, you know, my dad would say, hey, take these scissors to your mom and, and don't fall on them, you know, and I'm scared to death. I'm going to trip and fall and skew, skew myself with uh, scissors. And so I'm holding them out, you know, I'm taking these, uh, these there. But what about if you're given, you know, something even of greater value, something crystal, something breakable, uh, something that if you drop it, it's, it's not, it messes it up. And I think of that with the gospel. The gospel is so important, and Paul sensed that. And so in verse 1, his mentality, as he began to talk about ministry and to talk about his responsibility, his mindset was, I am a bondservant of Christ. Verse 1, Paul, a bondservant of Christ. You know, Paul could have said, Paul, a great leader, um, I'm a, you know, an important man in this early church. I'm, I'm the founder of the, of the church in this town and that town and the other town. But instead of going that way, he just presents himself humbly to them. I'm just a servant, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. And, you know, there's a lot of talk about servant, but truly it, it's in a sense a, a slave. I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. Uh, I am... I'm someone who, who takes my marching orders from Jesus Christ. I stand and, and wait for his, his directions. He's my owner. In fact, he saw not only that as his mentality, but he saw his master. And it's great to pick up on that right away. A bondservant of Christ Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ was his master. When, when we take that posture, first of all, I'm not my own man. I'm not a, a freewheeler, a freelancer who, who can call the shots on life. I have a master, and that master is none other than Jesus Christ. It puts your, your mind at, in the right place, doesn't it? And we need to have that mindset. Look at his ministry in verse 1. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle or called an apostle, literally, um, his ministry was that of an apostle. An apostle is a person who is sent. That's at the core of the meaning of, of the word apostle. And um, in a sense, there's nothing necessarily super special about the word. Lots of people in that day and age were sent ones. Uh, someone who would have a message would be sent. They would, they would say, I'm an apostle of of so-and-so because they were being sent with a message. And, um, and yet in, in Paul's case, it's a very special meaning because you will see in the scriptures that there are apostles with a capital A and there are apostles with a small letter A. In other words, there are people who are sent to, who do not have the office of apostle. But Paul is speaking here of this office of an apostle. He was hand-chosen selected by Jesus Christ to do a special ministry. Jesus Christ did something that he hasn't done with any of us. And in fact, as far as I know, he's never done this again since he went back to heaven. And that was in a blaze of light, he appeared to the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus and said, I've chosen you. You're a special person. I'm sending you out. And so we have this special commission of the Apostle Paul with a, with a job he sent out by Jesus Christ and he didn't take that lightly at all. In fact, he was very careful. He's going to tell us what his apostleship was about. What was it that he was taking out and bringing forth? And we're going to see that very shortly in these scriptures. But it was the gospel. It was the gospel. You know, there are, there's a lot of debate in the scriptures about, you know, who, who are the actual apostles and was Matthias um, the replacement of Judas and is uh, were there 13 apostles I, I can't uh, I, I have my opinion on that 
Um, and basically, my opinion goes to Revelation. And let's go to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. And um, verses 10 and forward. In verse 10, he says, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. So this beautiful city that will one day come down out of heaven from God and, and sit upon the, the new earth that will be there. And it says, having the glory of God, her brilliance was like a very costly stone as a stone of crystal clear jasper. And it had a great and high wall and 12 gates. And at the gates were 12 angels and names were written on them, which are those of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. Now, if you can figure out which 12 names will be on there, because Revelation has different names than some of the Old Testament names. Uh, there's, uh, some of them are the same, but, there's, uh, uh, but, but basically we know that it'll, it'll be the 12 sons of, of Abraham. That'll be, their names will be on those, on those gates. And I don't think anybody would argue with that. Um, but we, we go on down. And it says in verse 13, there were three gates on the east and three on the, on the north, three on the south and three on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones. So this wall has 12 stones, whether it's one massive stone each or, or 12 stones that are placed all over the place underneath. I can't really tell you because I wasn't there. But I can tell you that there are 12 stones. Something interesting about those stones. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And I personally don't, I personally think Paul's name is going to be on one of those stones, but uh, I, it could be Matthias and Paul's name won't be there. But I have very clearly, over and over from the scriptures, that Paul was an apostle. So I think that he was the actual replacement personally for uh, Judas and that his name will be on that on that if you believe otherwise you're in good company there are others who believe that way point is is that Paul was an apostle look at verse uh, verses 1 through 4 again he's talking about a message and verse 3 he says set apart or one it says set apart for the gospel of God and then he explains it in 2 3 and 4 and in those verses, he talks about Christ having been, on the one hand, a descendant of David. On the other hand, divine. So you have the divinity of this person. In that gospel, you have the, um, the, the, um, the resurrection in there. And if there was a resurrection, you have a death. And so I believe that the gospel that Paul preached is encapsulated in that about the man, the God-man Jesus Christ who died for our sins and who rose again on the third day. And this is the message of the gospel and this is what Paul was sent to preach. And so we have here the message of the gospel. The gospel is good news from God to undeserving sinners. Now, when, when he says gospel, that's what that means. Gospel, euangelion. Good news. A message that brings hope. A message that brings joy. A message uh, that, that is good in nature. And so he, has, he was set apart for the, good, the gospel. And the gospel is good news for undeserving sinners. The gospel was promised in the Old Testament. It wasn't this, this thing of Christ <coughs> coming and then Christ dying and being raised again on the third day. This message uh, of, of what God did on a weekend in history. And remember, news is always about an event, isn't it? I mean, you could, I guess, just say this is news. Um, but really, when you think of the meaning of news, you're talking about what happened today. Let's turn on the news to find out what's going on. Well, God has good news, but his good news didn't happen today. 
His good news happened on what I like to call a weekend in history. 2,000 years ago, the most important person who did the most important work that, that this world has ever known. And so the gospel has to do with a, an objective news report that is good for all humanity. And if you take and miss that point, then the gospel go, becomes what happens in my heart today. And then you get messed up. Because the gospel, as Paul said here, was something that he prophesied in the Old Testament and it found its fulfillment in a person, Jesus Christ. And so when we think, think of the gospel, we're talking about an objective historical message about what God did to bring joy and happiness and peace and forgiveness to this world. To bring eternal life to, to this, on the scene. And if you miss that, then the gospel becomes a little ditty that you say. A little phrase uh, rather than an event. And so when he's talking here about the euangelion, it has to do with news, good news about something that happened. And of course he says there the source of it is God himself. Good news from God. It was promised, look at verse 2. Which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And so I want you to hear that so that you're not uh, caught up in the thinking of many today. That, that Jesus just got in a bad situation, you know. I mean, he was going along well and people started rejecting him. And they decided to kill him. And so God decided to make something good out of that. You know, make the best out of a bad situation. I remember being in Venezuela and... President Chavez, when he gave us, uh, when he was going for election the first time, he was talking about how that, well, Jesus died for the truth, you know. In other words, he became a martyr for truth. Uh, that's not so. He didn't all of a sudden was telling the truth and they didn't like it, so they killed him. Rather, he came on a, on a mission and it was a, pur a purposeful trip here to save Humankind to give us eternal life. So the gospel is about one individual concerning his son. It's about the son of God. It's about God the son. It is about a person. Jesus Christ. And the gospel is about Jesus Christ the Messiah. Concerning his son who was born of a descendant of David. And so the gospel is the, this Messiah. It has to do with the Messiah of the Old Testament, the chosen one. It goes all the way, the gospel goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden where God promised that the, the woman would give birth to the seed and the seed would crush the head of the, of the serpent. And so the gospel is about Jesus Christ. In his humanity, Jesus was a descendant of David. He was, he was the prophesied eternal heir to the throne of David. And if you, un if you understand the Davidic covenant, you understand that um, Jesus Christ, in order to fulfill the Davidic covenant, would uh, need to come from David. And, uh, and this is indeed where he came. He came through Nathan's bloodline from David, though he was... Um, uh, he was uh, engendered by the Holy Spirit, but he, he has his, uh, so to speak, his bloodline through, through Nathan, not through Solomon, because of the Kaniah curse. Um, but on the other hand, he has his uh, adoptive rights through Joseph, through the line of, Sol uh, of Solomon. And so he is the one that, the, the heir. And isn't it interesting that Jesus dies in you know, 30-something A.D., and then 40 short years later, the temple is destroyed, and all records that were kept so carefully about the descendants, who was father, who was son, uh, about the Davidic line were destroyed. And um, so there's no need to continue that line <coughs> because Jesus uh, is the fulfillment of, of, uh, of the... Davidic covenant, and he's alive today. And isn't it interesting that no one ever disputed this claim? 
when Jesus was on the earth. That would have been my first thing. I would have gone and said, who does he think he is? He thinks he can be the Messiah. He'd have to come from David. And you know, I, the Bible doesn't say, but I guarantee you the Jews who were stuck on genealogies and everything went to the temple to find out if he really could be. Because nobody ever brought up, they did say, well, you're illegitimate or you're this, that, or the other, but they never said, you do not have rights to the throne of David. And uh, so he was, humanly speaking, the one. But also from the divine side, he was proven or declared to be the Son of God. Look at verse 4. Who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. And that took great power. No one can uh, do that on their own. Um, it would always take an outside source working upon them. Though Jesus said, I can lay my life down and I can take it up again. But when you read the New Testament, it was the Father and the Holy Spirit who gave him life and never himself. Um, he was raised by the power of God. Had he not paid for sin fully, had something been left undone, the resurrection wouldn't have happened. The Father would not have been able to legitimately raise him from the dead. And yet he was. He was proven to, with the power of the resurrection from the dead. And secondly, by the spirit of holiness. And that's a little difficult to interpret. Um, I think there's a couple of ways you can look at it. And one is um, the fact that the Spirit of God came visibly upon Jesus Christ. And from that point onward, he was a, um, he ministered God and, and proved that the voice was heard from heaven. This is my beloved Son. The Spirit of God visibly came upon him. And throughout his life, uh, the, the Spirit of God proved that he was the Son of God. Um, and it was proven through his way of being. Well, look at verse 5a there. It says in 5, Through whom we have received grace and apostleship. And, he, and the reason was to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. So his mandate was to bring about the obedience that comes from faith. His mission field was the whole world. Did I jump forward there? No. But in, no, okay. Um, look at verse 5. It says, Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles. And so he saw that, hey, I, I've, I've got the right to go into all the world. I think about that sometime in what we're doing in DM2 because sometimes there are are those who would say, you know, uh, you don't have the rights to come here to our country and share the gospel. And I have every right in the world to do it. Uh, and the reason is, is let's go to Matthew chapter 28. Verse 18. Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And so if he that has authority in heaven and on earth tells you to do something, you have the right to do it. That doesn't mean you may not be punished on this earth or persecuted for doing that, but you do have the right and the authority. And um, his motivation was the glory of God. He says there, to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. You see, that was, his, that was his driving motivation, I would say, in many senses. He had been given a commission. He, he had to obey that. He knew that. Was, it was important. He, was, he saw himself as, a, as the slave of Jesus Christ. And yet, his, I, I believe the motivation of his life was to bring glory to God. And what is so incredible is when we take the word of God and the gospel to the world, and especially when we go through the humble means that we do, it, it, God gets all the glory. And if, if there's anything that um, would be accomplished, you know, through uh, an event like this, 
by virtue of the fact that, that those of us who serve in this are, are nothing more than slaves, servants, he gets all the glory. And that should be in all of our ministry, in all of our lives. It's not about having our name in the, in the, on, the, on the billboard. And you see them around town, probably here even, where, you know, there's this church and the name of the church is in the corner and there's this big head on there of this pastor, you know. And it, it's just, just poking out of there. And, and um, you, you'd stop and wonder, maybe he's bringing all the glory to God, but it, it just seems sometimes to, to, to pre- present the opposite. And may Jesus Christ, may God be glorified in all we do. Now, if you'll flip your workbooks over, we're going to be seeing this chart from time to time. <clears throat> And um, we'll fill it in as we go. But we've, we've kind of covered a, a, a mini section here uh, in, in this first 17 verses. And, and it has to do with Paul felt that he was accountable for the gospel. And I hope you have that same accountability for the gospel. Look over in Jude, the book of Jude. Let's go to Jude chapter 7 since there's no chapters there. <laughs> We'll make up a chapter. Jude chapter, I mean Jude verse 3. It says, um, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. And so we have that same kind of responsibility to contend for this faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And here we have it, right here. This is what we contend for, is the word of God. And so Paul sensed that accountability, and we'll come back to this chart from time to time. Now, let's finish this little section and take a break. In chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, we, we read that Paul gives us greeting there, and it Paul acknowledges uh, a couple of things and the, that the Romans were. And first of all, he said, called, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. You know what the, isn't the whole world the called of Jesus Christ? No. And yes. <laughs> Jesus Christ is calling to the whole world. But those who can say, I am the called, are the ones that have responded to that call. I heard a very, a very good example of that the other day uh, by one of the DM2 teachers, and I'm going to steal it from him. Um, he said he, had a, he has a dog, and uh, the, the dog, uh, you know, gets a chance to run out from time to time out of the house, and so he goes out into the neighborhood and begins to call. You know, here, Fido, here, Fido, and yells and calls and and he said, he, he said sometimes, you know, he thinks the dog is just standing over there behind the bushes with a big smile on his face, you know, waiting. But at some point, the dog comes and he picks him up and puts him in the car. And, and he said he was the being called. But once he had him in the car, he was the called. And you see, that's, that's the difference because everyone in the world is the being called. All of us are being called. But only those who have responded to the call can say, I am the called of Christ Jesus. And I, I think it's a simple illustration, and, and yet that's what it is. Yeah. We are the called. Why? Because we responded to the call of Jesus Christ. That's why we are the called. <clears throat> and not only were the Romans among the called, but they were the beloved ones, beloved of God in Rome. You know... Um, I like that. Um, I like that thought because I think we can, uh, you know, we sing that song, I am my beloved's and he is mine and his banner over me is love. And, um, and yet we, we, we know that we're all loved of God. But when you think of your own family, you know, you, you have, or, or your own life, your own context, you, you may be a pastor of a church and you love the people in the church but your wife is your beloved one. Uh, She is special among those whom you love. And what we see here is that Paul wanted wanted them to understand that you are special among those whom God loves. And so you are the loved of the beloved of God. And not only that, they were saints. 
They were saints. They were set apart ones. Um, this doesn't mean that they uh, had statues built to them and candles burning at the feet of those statues. This doesn't mean that they wore halos. But he includes the whole church. Because anyone who, is a, who has believed is a saint. And so there's, there's St. Michael back there all the way from Africa. And you could see his halo when you look at him. I mean, there's, there's, uh, there's other saints. And every now and then sometimes people have horns sticking out of their halos. Uh, and, uh, but um, the truth is, is that saint means set apart one. And the moment you were born again, you were set apart by God in Christ Jesus. And you have this new relationship to God in the person of Jesus Christ. And that is why we are called saints. And we're set apart for a purpose, for his use. Now let's look at Paul's acclamation. Here in verse 7c, he says, To all who are beloved of God in Rome... Call to saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul wanted to um, claim a couple of things for them or, or at least wish a couple of blessings upon them. And one was grace. And I, I think it would be like what Peter said, you know, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Not that they needed more grace than they had. had. They needed to understand the grace that they had. They needed to bask in it. They needed to enjoy it. And so um, this is why Paul, what Peter said in, in the last of his book, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And this is why Paul would, would wish this here for them. And even speaking of grace, do you know that every book that Paul wrote, within the first few verses, there's a mention of grace and at the last of every book, there's a mention of grace. And what you have is this grace sandwich that, that the Lord prepares. And, and you, when you, for the Christian life, that's, that's how you live the Christian life. It's, it's couched in the grace of God. It's not with this heavy hand of, uh, of law and rejection if you fail over your head. It is a... It is a um, a hand, an open-handed approach to our lives. And so grace and then peace. And of course, we need the peace of God. We, we have peace with God as a given the moment you're born again. No more war. We're going to see that in Romans chapter 5. But we need this daily peace of God that would pervade and, and, and preside over our lives. And um, each, each Christian needs that. In fact, I think that when you look at the world, that's what they're so crying. That's how the Antichrist is going to come to power. Because this world wants peace. Peace at any cost. Just give me peace. And they'll give up rights. They'll give up freedoms <clears throat> to have peace. And yet, does it come when you give all those things up? I don't think so. And so we have this section that we can add to your books. And there would be a couple of times where you'll open that back page a, a few times. And this is one of those cases where we here have Paul's addressees. And those are the Romans. And he definitely wanted God's very, very best for them. So we're going to take a 10-minute break here. And we'll come back around 11.15. Uh, we'll blow the whistle. I think we're working out all the kinks on the recording.